Hello everyone. Grab yourself a stiff drink and sit back as we delve into one of the least informative videos about biology we've ever come across. Let's jump right in. Yes, Prager University, the conservative think tank hosted by Dennis Prager, has jumped headlong into intelligent design land. The video we're looking at today, titled Evolution, Bacteria to Beethoven, features intelligent design philosopher, not a biologist or a paleontologist, Stephen Meyer. We've talked about Meyer before with reference to his calamitous book Darwin's Doubt in two videos titled Darwin's Confidence, and here he is again making the same bad arguments. We showed there that Meyer both misrepresents the Cambrian explosion and how proteins evolve. So go check those out if you want a more in-depth look. Alright, let's get to the video. Evolution. You learned about it in high school. It goes like this. Life started out with very simple forms, and then gradually, over hundreds of millions of years, morphed into all the forms we see today. Okay, morphed is a terrible way to describe evolution. Pokemon morph, but real populations don't. Over generations, a population accumulates genetic variations caused by mutations and chromosomal recombination. Individuals have a particular set of variations, and these allow them to either survive or not. If they do survive, they pass the variations on, piling up the variations over time. Every individual is a member of one particular species and never morphs into anything else within its own lifetime. We could say Meyer's off to a bad start, but he's been doing this bad start for over 20 years, and it's wearing thin. Bacteria to Beethoven. Not a straight line, of course, but that's roughly how it went. This was the theory proposed by Charles Darwin in 1859, and with some modification, it's been embraced as unassailable by the scientific community over the last century. S some modification? Are you kidding? Darwin wouldn't recognize the theory of evolution today because it has moved so far since he died. DNA was determined to be the molecule of inheritance. Mendelian genetics became a thing. Actually, genetics as a whole field became a thing. Living and fossil biodiversity has increased tremendously. Whole new mechanisms of evolution have been added, including genetic drift and gene flow. Patterns of macroevolution have been more accurately established, such as punctuated equilibrium, a topic Meyer bungled badly in his Darwin's Doubt book. The little that Darwin did know about evolution has been hugely expanded. To say some modification has occurred is a gross understatement. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins says, if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. But is that right? Are there no scientific reasons to doubt the evolutionary account of life's origins? Did you hear that subtle shifting of goalposts? He moved from talking about the last few billion years of evolution to asking if there are any scientific reasons to doubt the evolutionary account of life's origins. But life's origin is a topic separate from evolution, called abiogenesis. We've talked about abiogenesis a number of times on this channel, so see the description for videos regarding that. There are, as we've mentioned, many unknowns regarding abiogenesis, but that doesn't mean magic is responsible for the origin of life. That's a god of the gaps fallacy. In November 2016, I attended a conference in London convened by some of the world's leading evolutionary biologists. The purpose? To address growing doubts about the modern version of Darwin's theory. So, Meyer has a bad habit of conflating questions or improvements on the modern evolutionary theory, with evolution itself having problems. He did this in Darwin's Doubt regarding a conference in 1968, and we explained his misunderstanding of the conference in Darwin's Confidence Part 2. Indeed, evolution is a constantly growing and changing theory, always tentative and receptive to corrections, unlike intelligent design and creationism. We've linked to the 2016 conference's page below, so go read about it. Nothing about the conference was anti-evolutionary, since many of the speakers were themselves evolutionary biologists. 
The point was to extend and expand our current understanding of the theory based on new data. As molecular biologist Douglas Futuma points out, quote, Evolutionary theory has been extended almost continually since the evolutionary synthesis, but the principal tenets of the synthesis have been strongly supported, the single most important exception being the greater importance accorded by genetic drift, especially in molecular evolution. The calls for an extended synthesis today are largely a continuation of this process. Close quote. The talks appear to have been quite fascinating and totally supportive of evolution. What a shock. Let's look at just two scientific reasons to doubt this theory. First, the Cambrian explosion. A weird and wonderful thing happened 530 million years ago. A whole bunch of major groups of animals, what scientists call the phyla, appeared abruptly within a geologically short window of time, about 10 million years. We've shown, both in Darwin's Confidence Part 1 and the Cambrian Explosion Part 1, that this is false. Sponges, tenophores, placozoans, cnidarians, and bilaterians evolved before the Cambrian, based on numerous molecular clock estimates, as seen in two 2017 papers titled Dating Early Animal Evolution Using Phylogenomic Data, and a large and consistent phylogenomic data set supports sponges as the sister group to all other animals. The Cambrian explosion itself is in two different radiations, one of stem lineages in the early Cambrian and one of crown lineages in the later Cambrian. The first radiation follows the appearance of the small shelly fauna, which followed the appearance of the weird Ediacarans, which came long after the first animal fossils appear in the record. The explosion seems largely to be a result of increased organismal biomineralization, which increased the likelihood that those animals would get preserved. These novel animal forms exhibiting prototypes of most animal body designs we see today emerged in the fossil record without evidence of earlier ancestors. Uh, yes and no. The precursor forms he mentions don't look much like their modern descendants, but they do look exactly like what evolutionary biologists were predicting chordate ancestors would look like. Pekaya, for instance, doesn't really look like anything alive today except for lancelets, a very basal representative of our phylum. It's true that there are as yet no known protochordates in the Precambrian, but that doesn't mean they didn't exist. Any chordate ancestor would be uh, at best small enough to fit on a coin, and the lack of soft-bodied organisms of that size in the fossil record is a result of taphonomy, as paleontologists have known for years. We did a video on that subject, too. Did you catch that? A huge number of diverse animals appeared with no discernible antecedents. So where did they come from? This question really bothered Darwin, and he acknowledged that he could give it no satisfactory answer. Uh, actually, the lack of Cambrian fossils in Darwin's day didn't bother him that much. You think that if it really bothered him so much, he'd write more about it, but he doesn't. Sure, it was a question, but not a huge one. Nor can scientists today. The renowned biologist Eugene Koonin of the National Center for Biotechnology Information describes the abrupt appearance of the Cambrian animals and other organisms such as dinosaurs, birds, flowering plants, and mammals as a pattern of biological big bangs. Did you catch that? Koonin didn't actually say Cambrian animals, dinosaurs, birds, flowers, or mammals were inexplicable under evolution. All he said was that they were big bangs, which is fine, we guess. Koonin's paper was about the origin of deep cellular systems, including horizontal gene transfer and endosymbiotic processes, Myers Intelligent Design Discovery Institute downplays or rejects. Why Koonin keeps getting quote-mined that way is an even bigger mystery than abiogenesis. At any rate, we've done videos explaining the evolution of all these groups, and those are in the description. So what caused all these new forms of life to arise? That question leads to a second big doubt, the DNA enigma. In the 1950s, James Watson and Francis Crick made a startling discovery. The DNA molecule stores information as a four-character digital code. Strings of precisely sequenced chemicals inside the DNA helix store the instructions, the information, for building the crucial proteins that cells need to survive. We must say that we're glad Meyer is one of the few anti-evolutionists to define information. It's so often just a useless buzzword. Here, though, he defines information as protein-coding genes, which at least has use. 
So are we to think that the much larger spread of non-coding DNA represents no genetic information at all? Does Meyer really want to say that? Unless the chemical letters in the DNA text are sequenced properly, a protein molecule will not form. No proteins, no cells. No cells, no living organisms. Bill Gates has said DNA is like a software program. Let's think about that for a second. For computers to run faster and perform more functions, they require new code. Well, the same is true for life. To build new forms of life, the evolutionary process would need to produce new genetic information, new code. But this raises questions about the creative power of natural selection and mutation. Well, there are a number of problems here. For one, comparing DNA to a computer code is overly simplistic. After all, you can mutate a strand of DNA and still produce the same amino acid sequence. That's why the genetic code is called redundant or degenerate. You can't do that with a computer's code, though. The other problem here is that Meyer is way behind the evolutionary developmental biology data curve. Seemingly, large morphological changes tend to require rather few genetic changes. Often, generating evolutionary novelties is the result of shuffling and fusing, duplicating, or changing the regulation pathway of pre-existing genes. You don't have to create whole new genes to create whole new morphological structures. One place this has been especially borne out is with regard to the evolution of multicellularity. In plants, fungi, and animals, many of the genes and proteins needed for multicellularity already existed in their unicellular cousins, whether they be algae, chytrids, or coanoflagellates, respectively. In fact, in vulvacine algae, unicellular and multicellular members with differentiated cells have almost identical genomes. A recent paper on coanoflagellates furthered how much cellular machinery needed for multicellularity existed before animals did. Natural selection is a simple sorting process. Species keep favorable mutations that allow them to survive, but eliminate bad mutations that cause their members to die out. No one doubts that natural selection is a real process and that it produces minor variations. But many biologists now doubt that it produces major innovations in biological form. Of course researchers should doubt that natural selection produces major morphological changes. It doesn't change anything. As Meyer just said, natural selection is a sorting process. Mutations and recombination create the variations, and natural selection acts on those. Does Meyer listen to himself? To see why, think again about software. What happens if you introduce a few random changes into computer code? You'll likely mess it up, right? Though it might still work if you don't make too many changes. But if you make enough random changes, your program will stop functioning altogether. You certainly can't keep doing this and expect some cool new program to pop out. There's a mathematical reason for this. In all codes and languages, there are vastly more ways of arranging characters that will generate gibberish than there are arrangements that will generate meaningful sequences. And this applies to DNA. Remember, natural selection only selects sequences that random mutations generate. Yet experiments have established that DNA sequences capable of making stable proteins are extremely rare, and thus really hard to stumble on randomly. Again, computer code is a terrible analogy for DNA. You can mutate DNA and essentially not affect the host organism at all, while you generally can't do this for computers, as Meyer points out. You also have to understand that the vast majority of genetic mutations are neutral, that is, they cause no harm or benefit to the host. This is at odds with what happens to a program if you introduce a bunch of mutations. You also have to remember that a computer code operates on over 30 letters and symbols, while DNA only has four. The degree to which you can change a nucleotide sequence and retain its functionality is vastly different than altering a computer code. How rare? While working at Cambridge University, molecular biologist Douglas Ack showed that for every DNA sequence that generates a relatively short functional protein, there are 10 to the 77th power non-functional sequences. Now consider that there are only 10 to the 65th power atoms in our galaxy. So finding a new DNA sequence capable of building a functional protein is like searching blindfolded for a single marked atom among a trillion Milky Way galaxies. Talk about a needle in a haystack. 
Yes, this would be a problem if protein sequences came from randomly selected nucleotides, but they don't. Meyer's argument hinges on a false dilemma. Again, we showed in creationist statistics that evolving proteins is quite easy and happens all the time in the lab and in nature. As I show in my book Darwin's Doubt, even four billion years of life's history is not enough time to overcome a search problem this big. Actually, the truth is the exact opposite. The 2008 paper, How Much of Protein Sequence Space Has Been Explored by Life on Earth, shows that over life's four billion year history, and given a few reasonable assumptions, quote, it is instead quite plausible for all of functional protein sequence space to have been explored, close quote. Given that Meyer published Darwin's Doubt in 2013, this data was available to him, but he failed in one capacity or another to utilize it. And so that ends the video. Meyer then just recaps his two arguments, but we've seen that both lines are horrendously flawed. Evolutionary theory is still the best explanation for the diversity of life, and intelligent design is still unsupported and unscientific. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.